This is Deron Chavis, and we're here at Black Space Matters. I'm here with Michael Carter Jr., who is a farmer and also a food justice advocate. Talk a little bit about uh, the work that you do around agriculture. Gotcha. Uh, Michael Carter Jr. with Carter Farms and Aquaculture and Hinasim and Carter Brothers, uh, various businesses that we have under the Carter umbrella. I'm a fifth generation farmer. My family land in Orange County, Virginia, uh, that we've been maintaining in the family since 1910. It's in my blood, you know, and at this point I can't deny it, you know, and I worked in Ghana, West Africa, I worked in Kenya, I worked in Israel, doing what I love to do and what I do best. So tell us a little bit about this concept of food justice. How are you interpreting, you know, the term food justice as it relates to the work that you do in community? You know, food justice begins with food choice what you choose to put in your body, what you choose to consume. That's when the justice really starts to happen. When you start becoming an advocate for yourself and your health, your community sees a difference, your personal life sees a difference. Many times we talk about food deserts and food apartheid. In a capitalistic society, you're talking about economics. Mm -hmm. right. So everything is driven by supply and demand. And I've been a part of various grocery stores and food organizations in the early 2000s, and also had to help them pack up and close down these grocery stores. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a push right now, black farmers are probably in style. We're very popular right now. Right, right, but right. to sustain us, you gotta buy from us. We don't need the advocates, as I always say, we need customers. Right, right. In Virginia right now, the black farmer is virtually extinct. Mm -hmm. We went from about 50,000 black farmers in 1925 to now approximately 1,300. So you're talking about almost a 98% decline for in less than 100 years. Right. We gotta save the black farmer. <laughs> We're at an extinction level event. And the best way to do that is to vote with your dollars, vote with your pocketbooks. And if you invest in us, we're guaranteed to invest back into our communities that we come from or that we definitely look like us and support us. For me, that is a topic of conversation that, that coincides with the uh, decline of black land, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you talk a little bit about why land is important. There was a great migration to the north mm -hmm. in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s. One of my uncles were burnt. In, in a building. Mm. Lynch mob came, cornered him in the building, and they burnt down the building. Mm. And these are the stories that many of our families have of being terrorized off of our land after the civil rights movement, that integration killed our collective efforts of supporting one another. So instead of supporting the black farmers who we had been supporting for ages, we started going to Winn-Dixie and Safeway and Giant and Food Lion and Publix and Kroger's. Right. So, and as young people in the 50s and 60s, they were more apt to go and try to study business, psychology, history, mm -hmm. to get out of the rural areas and go into the urban areas. Land as a resource continues to appreciate in value. Right. 2021 now, we need to have a reverse migration back to the land, to own land again, own a quarter acre, own a half acre. Right now, land is going for about $5,000 an acre in Virginia. You're gonna get a $1,200 stimulus check next week or next couple of weeks. That's a great down payment on an acre of land. And that's, you know, land is power. How is it that a community like, you know, Wyoming or Montana has more political power than a place like Washington, D.C.? Certainly. Because of land and land ownership. Mm -hmm. And once we understand that land is politics, mm -hmm. land is also economics and resources, mm -hmm. that if you have land, you got food, clothing, and shelter. So, you know, the long-term goal with land is sustaining yourself and your family mm -hmm. and also providing a legacy. You know, I'm blessed to have a family, you know, a great, great grandparents who had a vision. Right. So back then it was a $722 investment. Now that investment is valued at about $2 million. Mm, 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 mm. You know, wow. when you think about black land mattering and all of this other stuff that's happening, Trump coming out of office and mm -hmm. the rise of, of, of white supremacist, you know, ideologies and personas, you know, how does, how does land, the, the need for black land fit into that uh, for, for you? The need for black land fits into a certain aspect of liberation and confidence. That once you start owning something, your value itself increases tremendously. Black lives matter just as much as black land. And I would dare say probably black land matters not more, but in a more a deeper way. It has systemic value to the community right. and to your legacy. Right. The community projects that we're in, we don't own any of that. Right. We go, somebody else comes in. You know, that's one generation of living. Yeah, that's right. not how, you know, that's not how you sustain any type of movement, let alone your life. 
this issue can be solved in our own community. Certainly. We have our own <clears throat> ability to change the narrative with definitely a, a greater political voice, a greater social voice, should become a greater social message. Mm -hmm. That the message should be crafted towards something that's meaningful to us. Not a hashtag, not a slogan, but a plan. What does black space look like now? Mm -hmm. And how does it help us? Um, what does resiliency for you mean in this work of agriculture, uh, race, ecological justice? Mm -hmm. right? Resiliency is a mother and a father uh, because it's a blessing and a curse. Uh, resiliency says you can endure a lot and maintain. It's a curse because because you can endure a lot and maintain, you endure a lot and maintain. <laughs> right. And that's been an issue with black people in America, black people in the West, black people in Africa mm. for the last four to six hundred years. Mm. Whereas because we're so resilient, because we can endure just about anything, we've kind of been, been enduring anything and not putting up a fight. You know, so resiliency is a blessing and a curse and we have to kind of temper resilience with a certain determined will mm -hmm. to not have to be so resilient. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in the food justice space, black farmers have been resilient. Mm -hmm. Kind of taking bad loans, mm -hmm. having, you know, very few or no customers, dealing with discrimination from an institutional perspective to a local level to black people level. Because every Black History Month, you hear about Booker T. Washington, you hear about George Washington Carver and his great peanut and sweet potato. Mm. Resiliency can kind of make you complacent. And I think that's really what has happened in the food justice arena, is that we've gotten really complacent. Mm. So having easier access now to these grocery stores, uh, to these corner stores, with food-like products right. that we substitute and call food, you know, has, kind of, has been our downfall. Mm. Mm. We've gotten lazy. Real food is not convenient. You know, my salads, when you get out the garden, don't come pre-washed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, my kale doesn't come already chopped up and in the bag already. Right. You know, and that's the kind of mindset that we have. <clears throat> and beyond being resilient, we need to be more self-determined. Mm -hmm. That's the phrase that needs to kind of come in. A self-determination has to come in that makes you determined to feed yourself, mm -hmm. feed your family, mm -hmm. feed your community, without depending on anyone else. Mm -hmm. Supporting ourselves is the most valuable means of resistance you know but when we create spaces that we can be ourselves within <laughs> I, you know it's, it's, it's an opportunity for us to decompress think about what's next you know or at least uh, at least breathe for a moment but i didn't even have to think about what's next right even having our space we need time to decompress mm. and to figure out what this space looks like because this is new to us so we need a, a season if not a generation of just having space to figure out what this actually is supposed to be, <laughs> how we're supposed to actually act. How can we actually engage with each other in a way that's meaningful and healing? Right. And you can't hear a 400 year cancer with a month, right. Right. you know, with a season, with a year, with a hashtag. Right. You can't do that. Right. Can you have an African dream for yourself and your family and your community that fits in with your American mindset and your American reality, right. but honors both legacies? Mm -hmm and understands that you couldn't have one without the other. Right. How, what do you consider your work, you know, going into 2021? You know, what's your role to hold, so to speak? <laughs> First of all, you know, setting up my farm to be more of a agro-tourism, Afro-tourism uh, reality, mm -hmm. as well as growing, you know, African and ethnic foods, uh, working with farmers throughout the region, uh, growing myself. So my sons have a, a seed business, so we're gonna continue to grow out seeds for that as well as grow seeds out for other companies like Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. Once it becomes legal, we're gonna use marijuana and hemp as our gateway plant to agriculture and vocations. Uh, to try to increase the number of young black farmers that are coming to the pipeline. Uh, right now, the average age for a black farmer in the state is 63 years old. Um, but we need to lower that. We need to get it down to like 40. Uh, bring in our young people. And the best way to bring in young people is to show them that it's viable, economically viable. To me, 2020 was a very good season. Yeah. <clears throat> and 2021 is gonna be the a better season because more people, we planted seeds in 2020 to support black farmers. Nice. That's it. So put it, you know, put your faith in us, show us that you love us by spending with us. All right, well, yeah, we've been two did uh, with Michael Carter Jr. Uh, this is Black Space Matters. <laughs>